welcome to another edition of Harona and I am Harona Drame. Today my guest is Dr. Aminata Silla. Doctor, welcome to Harona. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I know I see you come in on Gambia and go out and I know you have a great passion for teaching. That's where we're going to start. Where do you get that passion for teaching? It's not the most easy thing to do, is it? Well, I guess because I have such a passion for it, to me it's easy because it's not working. It's my passion. I love doing it. So it's fun. It's fun. I, I can talk all day. I just don't like the grading part of it, but I can stay in front of the classroom and um, talk to my students and interact with them and engage them because I feel the best form of knowledge is when there's a discussion going on and there's an exchange of knowledge you know, happening. And, and I, I fell into teaching. It, it's, I didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a teacher or a professor. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, maybe people around me knew, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that I, that's what I wanted. I actually wanted to be a lawyer. That was my dream for the, as long as I could remember. I wanted oh. to be a lawyer. But teaching, just I just fell into it, and I don't know where and how, but it's just something that happened, and I'm glad it happened. Yeah. Are you more comfortable teaching adults and grown-ups than doing children and younger folks? Oh, absolutely. I tell people, if I were teaching children, I will be in an orange jumpsuit on the 10 o'clock news <laughs> because I don't think I will have the... Um, the patients and I, I, you know, kudos and hats off to people that teach young kids because I just couldn't do it. It's not something that I would do. So I'm very comfortable teaching and training adults then doing it with children. I just don't have that. And I'll admit it, I don't have the patience and um, I'm not trained to, do, to, to work with children. So I wouldn't be able to do it, not even if I tried. So going back to wanting to be a lawyer, how were you preparing yourself for that uh, your worship uh, role at the time? Oh man, I would read. I read anything. Like all the people that knew me in Gambia High School, when you ask for Amina Tasila, you know what they will say? Jahabuga book. The girl that loves books. What, I, was it Milton Bones? So? Oh yeah, that was one of those. The Harlequin, the Milton Bones, the Nancy Drew, my favorite, because you know the girl detective. She was powerful. You know, she. I just fell in love with that. So I actually started collecting Nancy Drew. So I am. Mm -hmm. I've collected up to number like the hard back ones up to number sixty three. So listeners out there, if you have more, let me know. So yeah, Nancy Drew is just something that I I love. I think it was just because I saw this girl and doing things that I felt like, you know, I could do this. Like she's mm -hmm. discovering things and she's a girl growing up in a patriarchal society where my voice wasn't heard. But I, I, I saw this person who was doing great stuff and I, you know, I aspired to be something. Superwoman. And yeah. Even if it's not, if even not superwoman, maybe Wonder Woman, you know, like, you know, stand out there and do something, right? Yeah. So that's what I was aspiring to. So what were your memories growing up and do you have any impediments to that story of wanting to become that Wonder Girl, Wonder Woman? Well, see, I grew up, my, um, I lived in Liberia for a while until I was, I think, about six or seven. And then we moved here to the Gambia. And my home, we didn't speak anything but the Liberian Pidgin English and English. So everything I learned from Mandinka to Wolof is I learned it outside. I had a great experience in schools. Like I went to Wesley, I don't know if we're going to get there, but I went to Wesley Primary and then I spent a year in Newtown Primary and then I went to Gambia High School. I had great experience. My school, you know, years were fantastic. But I think because speaking English in school and at home, rather at home mostly, going to school, I thought, baby, you know, people will like me because I spoke English, but people didn't appreciate me speaking English. They said, you know, like, I'm showing off, but that's what I spoke. That's my language, mm -hmm. you know? It, it's funny because yesterday someone asked me, what do you dream in? Because I asked about a definition of a word in Maninka. Mm -hmm. And I said, I dream in English. I think in English. So it's difficult for me to kind of then you have to translate your exactly, word from Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it takes me a little bit. So my impediments, it might sound trivial, but I think that almost killed my passion for learning. Because why were everybody teasing me for reading? Why was everybody teasing me for speaking English or sh like showing off? So, but I had great friends and, you know, and my principal in high school, Mr. Ka, was one of those, like, he would seize books from me all the time because I was never paying attention in class. I would be reading and all my teachers would seize the books from me. And then when we have um, our uh, 
fundraising, I'll buy my books back. <laughs> because they'll sell the books and I have to rebuy my books. And I had to because I was, you know, everyone in my neighborhood known I was the girl that go around door to door asking, books. loaning books. I got to buy the books back. It's all the people's books. Yeah, so I think that, and even today, I, I was talking to someone about this, that we really actually need to inspire and us, uh, people, children, to read more. Because one thing I can guarantee you, when I got out of Gambi High School, I may not have known a lot of stuff, but I knew how to read. Mm. And read the, well. And, yes, and read well. And understand what you're reading. Exactly. But that's changed, and that's a whole other interview for a whole other time, because that would take a whole lot of time to talk about that. Yes. You, you would, um, going to Gambi High School, did you do all levels, A levels? Oh, yes. So, see, we were the guinea pigs for the change in the educational system, the, the senior grade, secondary grade 12, school. Yes. 9, 12. Exactly. Yeah. So, we were the guinea pigs. We were the ones, the first people that were experimented on with this whole moving from the form, the form system to the SS, SS1 or whatever, how many SS is there. Mm -hmm. So, we were the first. So, I didn't do the A levels or the O levels. I did the senior secondary school. Grade 12. Grade 12, yes. And then. I did my exams on Friday, on Saturday night I left. And that's it? And that's it. Then when you, what did you do at uh, grade 12? Well, you do all of these subjects, right? You didn't I specialize. Did. I did, I specialized We had in to art. specialize in form three, I think, with the form systems. We specialized in grade nine. Okay. So I, of course, it was a given I was gonna go do arts because, you know, we, I did the literature and it's interesting because you can look up, <laughs> my sister said, I want to frame your certificate because it's all A's, but then there's a big fat F with math. Yes. So I can't and do anything. And it's an F. It's an F, yes. I did, I did better than you <laughs> so, in math. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I laugh about it. I think just because I, did, I had such a terrible found, uh, foundation in math that it just followed me throughout my career, even to the doctorate level. <laughs> you still have weakness I marks. still have a very weak uh, foundation. My foundation was weak, and when the foundation is weak, anything you build on it will crumble. Yeah. So um, even when I was doing my dissertation, I could have gone for a quantitative methodology, but I went to a qualitative because it's more, it's something I can read and then I can quantify instead of just looking at pure numbers and then trying to explain the number. Because a number is just a number until you put some meaning to it. And I couldn't do it, so. That's where we are. That's where we are, and we'll take our first break here. When we come back, more with Dr. Aminata Silla. Stay with us. Welcome back to Harona with my guest, Aminata Silla, doctor. Welcome back. Thank so you. when you went to the U.S., uh, you, you wanted to do the law still or you had changed your mind at that point? Oh, I still wanted to do law. So I went in and my um, counselor advised me to do business and law. So that's what I did. My bachelor's is in actually business and law. And then I uh, was uh, president of the pre-law society. I was really on track for this law thing, okay? Mm -hmm. But um, along the way, I started working in a social service agency, um, mm -hmm. working with youth, like young people. And I started questioning, like I read some of the stuff, they, you know, uh, the policies regarding the young people within the community. And I started being interested in policies. Mm -hmm. And I started seeing a shift I started looking more towards not how to write policy, but actually teaching people how to write better policies. I don't know where that came from, but I would read a policy and say, this could be better. This could be better, you know? And that passion, that drive pushed me to move further. And then I went to do my master's and I did my master's in public administration because I felt um, I didn't want to do political science. I could have gone into political science and do some public policy, but I did public administration because I feel like uh, public administrators are 
people who have souls, because these are the people that actually find solutions to societal problems. These mm -hmm. are some of the social ills and societal ills. They are the ones actually, the wicked problems of the world. Um, public administration scholars actually find solutions to those. And not uh, nothing against political science uh, people, but that's not where I was going. So I did my yeah. MPA, my master's in urban, in local government and urban planning, because I was interested in planning and how, how do you plan for a society as it grows and things of that nature. So I just followed that track until I did my doctorate. And my doctorate again was in public administration and management. So I kept close to the management portion just because I, once I went on that track, I knew I was going to start coming back to the Gabby as well. Mm -hmm. And that's where we rode. <laughs> that's where we rode. But uh, we saw you came in Gambia, you were working with the university mm -hmm. for a year or two, yeah. and then you disappeared again. Well, I, 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 I will change the word from disappear mm -hmm. to um, leaving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you left. I did. I left. So um, I left. I think to put it in a politically correct way. It's just the, 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 the environment at the time was not conducive for me being here. I spent a year here, I was teaching, I was working at the university, um, I had moved. I actually wanted to come home. I had that yearning in me that coming home, I will make a difference. Like I was gonna change things, I was gonna make a difference. I had my degrees, I was gonna be fantastic. You know, I think it took me two weeks to become humbled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I stuck it out for a year because I said, you know, I got one year contract and I'm going to stay and I'm going to stick it out. And I came with two young kids, a toddler and uh, two toddlers, really. So came back home and I was really ready to fight the good fight and make a difference. But fighting the good fight as an individual, just one person, it's like one person just trying to, um, you're pouring water into this ocean. Bottomless. Yes. And it's just. Every time you put it in, and there are holes in the bucket, mm -hmm. so you put it in, it pours out. You You're put it in, it basket. pours out. Yeah, so it's just, it, I was frustrated. I, and I just felt like the culture, the work ethics, the work culture. I mean, this is a public agency. I came from a culture because at the time, I think I've stayed a longer time in the US than I stayed in the Gambia. So that culture, the work ethics, the work culture that had been instilled in me was completely different from the one that's here. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where we clashed. I clashed with a lot of people on that. Like, you know, I come to work at eight o'clock and people don't show up until 10 o'clock. So it was just crazy. And um, it couldn't, I couldn't survive in an environment like that. And there was no support. If there was a support system, I would have probably stayed, but there was no support. And that's why I ended up now I disappear towards the end. <laughs> okay. Yes. You disappear towards the end. Yes. Now, going back to the U.S., your first jobs, were they like uh, teaching roles? Because I still want to establish how a wannabe lawyer became a teacher. Yes. So it was during my master's, my MPA program, I was attached to the, I did my master's in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I was attached to uh, DuPage County, this is the county that I lived in. I was attached to their, the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. And as an intern, one of my uh, tasks there was to help develop policies and then we go into the community and train community um, workers. And, uh, well, not going to community, the community will come into the mayor's office and train. And through the training, and I'll stand there, and the deputy mayor said to me, do you know, like, you jump when you were talking, like you're ex excited. Like, do you notice that? I said, no, I, I don't notice it. So this was just a pattern then. Everywhere I went, people would tell me, oh, you know, you're doing this. And then when I started doing my doctoral, my doctoral degree, I, you, part of my doctoral training is that you have to be in a classroom, you have to teach. Mm -hmm. And during teaching and training, I just kind of connected with the students and, you know, started teaching and doing my evaluations. My evaluations were off the charts. And I said, you know what? I think I, I, I don't feel like I'm actually working when I'm doing this. Well, unless when I'm grading, then that's when I feel like I'm actually working. Yeah. But when I'm standing in front of the students, I don't feel like I'm working. I actually love this. I think I can make something out of this. Because I was getting the PhD in a selfish way to, because my husband moved a lot because of his job. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was getting it as a security blanket. 
I'm telling myself, okay, I'm going to get this PhD, and at least with this degree, wherever we go, I can have job security. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to get it. It was not because I wanted to teach. And that's why I said I fell into it. Maybe people around me knew, but mm -hmm. even my friends here, they always tell, oh, we always knew you were going to teach. And I don't understand how they knew and I didn't know. So, yeah, it wasn't, I, I was just getting that PhD, not purely for any kind of altruistic reason because, oh, I love teaching and I wanted to teach. No, I was getting it because I wanted to be secure in a job. And it had nothing to do with teaching and training and what have you. But it was later that it all clicked and made sense. It all clicked and made sense. So we're going to go for a second break. When we come back, more with Dr. Aminata Silla. Stay with us. Welcome back to Harona with Dr. Aminata Silla. Doctor, this is the last segment of the show. Uh, we go back to your professional career. What do you do now? I mean, besides occasionally coming and helping out at the University of the Gambia, what do you do? So I am assistant professor at Towson University, where I teach courses in, of course, uh, political science. So I, as I said before, my background is public administration, so I am the only public administration scholar within my department because I'm in the Department of Political Science. And I teach courses in urban um, government and politics and metropolitan studies. So I teach courses on race and racism in America. So the difficult things that we don't want to talk about, all the isms mm -hmm. uh, that we in America don't want to talk about. And I live in a very... Um, um, where we don't have a lot of African-American population on campus. So it's very interesting classroom discussions. And that's, of course, it's a great time to be teaching politics right now in America because of the, uh, our political sphere and arena and what's happening around us. Um, on top of that, I also run an organization called Global Youth um, Innovation Network. So we have about 8,000 members around different countries in different parts of the world. Um, we have our coordinator here in the Gambia. Of course, I also do nonprofit work and um, do our organization for Youth Excellence Joy, mm -hmm. um, where we sponsor children here in the Gambia. So I, I have my hand in pretty much everything, but they're all connected to who I am as a person, right? They're all connected to my passion, to what I want to do, to what I like doing. So if it's training, education, that's what I want to do. So uh, professionally, I'm still an assistant professor. That's my full-time job. And mm -hmm. of course, I do other things as well. And I do come back to the Gambia twice a year during the summer, winter or December, and in the summertime to teach at the University of the Gambia. I'm going to throw you out there. Um, there's an impeachment trial going on now. And uh, we know Congress has done their job. Now, what's your prediction with the Senate? It's not going to happen. Do you think the Republicans it's, are I mean, just going to stick rep together? Republicans are single-minded. Not let me put it this way: politicians are single-minded seekers of re-elections, and all of those people—they—they're not going. They're thinking about their political career. Of course, they're not going to re-impeach. That's my prediction. So he's going to get away with it. Well, it's got. There's still going to be a a, a a blot on his. He'll be stained. Yeah, but there'll be a blot there. At least, if nothing else, we got him impeached. Right, so he, there will be a blot on his, uh, uh, it's kind of like looking at your resume and then you see this block thing there, you're wondering, what is this? Oh yeah, that was when I got impeached, <laughs> you know, so it will always be there, so. So he may remain president. He may remain president, and uh, if, if. At there least is, uh, through the end of this term. Through the end of this term. And it will be um, interesting to see if we as Americans actually reelect him. You know, there's a saying that every generation deserves the president that they get, mm -hmm. right? So we'll see. Um, did America need it? Did we need uh, what we have, Trump, what we have right now? Maybe. To kind of show us some of the things that we know it's there that, you know, our wounds from the past, you know, 
about um, race and racism, inequality, the um, wealth disparity, and all of that things. Those things have always been there, but it's, you know, we put band-aid on our issues over there. But I think Trump just kind of ripped it off, and um, we're trying to fix those problems instead of just putting band-aid on it. You know, that's what we've been doing, just band-aid. Band-aid doesn't solve anything, because unless we get to the root of the problems, we are not going to be able to do anything about anything. We'll come back to Gambia. We're still talking about politics. Three years, Jatna is all over the place. This new president in Gambia is also on some sort of trial. What do you think? Well, that's the key word, or let me say, um, that's the operative word you're using. He's on trial. So, um, but who's putting him on trial, though? The public, the voters. The voters are putting him on trial, and I guess I'm going to throw this back at you. I think you're trying to be politically correct <laughs> right now. So you're thinking it through, what's my response going to really be? So I'm giving you time now to really rethink, arrange your words, put your thoughts together, and there you go. I think you're ready now. Let's go. <laughs> you just said all of that. Well, I mean, you know, when he first took office, I said, okay, great, fantastic. We have someone different, uh, someone that has not been tried and tested. I was a little bit concerned. This is someone that's, that has not been tried and tested. But it could either be an opportunity or it could be a disaster. It could be an opportunity if we had good people surrounded him, right? Because... It, it would have been a great opportunity if you've hired people or you surrounded yourself by people who tell you what to do. I think you're thinking this is a disaster. So, well, it, it, it's, 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 um, it's like you're steering a boat in the dark ocean mm -hmm. and you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. That's where we are right now. We don't know where we're going. I feel like we're regressing and we're mm -hmm. supposed to be progressing, but we are regressing in a lot of things. Three years, this so much hope, so much passion, you know, high hopes for this presidency. But every day, slowly, and it's sad because as, I'm speaking now as a, as a Gambian, you know, every day my hope slowly fizzles. But I'm optimistic about the citizens, us, the people of the Gambia, of our passion for, for something better. We want better. And I think we are not going to sit back and allow anyone to fool us anymore. The answer you're actually looking for and wanted to say is Barrow is not the president we need at this moment. I've, oh, I've said this before. I said, um, I think the honorable thing to do would be to step down when, to step down on the agreed So for you term. three years, Jagna. <laughs> Why do you want to put this in my mouth? You want me no, to I'm actually just, say you're it? You're asking for him to leave. So, I'm I mean, asking, that's I'm what saying, they're asking for. I'm saying the honorable thing to do, and I'm not saying... Uh, so we are saying he's not honorable. If he were, he would. <laughs> the honorable thing for him to do is to step down. How about that? Now, or at the end of the five years. No, when his mandate was for the coalition. Which is the three years. So three years job now. <laughs> <laughs> No, okay. Now, now let's go with current day Gambia, the opportunities, the chances. I mean, you did come when Jamie was president, you did stay for a year, and then you had to leave. Now, now that you're back, do you feel there's a difference? Do you feel there's a major difference, so to speak? Yes, I feel there's a difference, and the difference is, again, in the people. Um, I, change, there has to be changes, right? And it has to start with, we have to do what I call the hardware and the software change. Software meaning the people, the soft skills. Those ones, we, we need good people in the right places. And then we need the infrastructure, the, the, the hardware. But we don't have infrastructure and we don't have the good people, the right people in the right places. We have people, but they're not really the right people for institutions. Because what, what I'm seeing right now, I go to different institutions, is that we are making our institutions in the images of the leaders. And that's not good. Because when those leaders leave, another one comes in, he makes the institution in his image or in her image as well. So we need strong institutions that would outlive the individual. The individuals. We have to do that. And our institutions in this country or in many, in many African countries were made as structured on colonial values that were meant to repress us. So unless we come up and contextualize our own issues and our own problems, we can't keep looking to the West all the time because whoever controls the purse strings controls the direction of policy. We, 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 we bend ourselves into impossible shades because we want to please the donors. That cannot be helpful. 
I, I get that. But what's next for you? I mean, you've you've come to the height you wanted. You have a PhD. You're having fun with your job. What's next? Continuing to build and um, train young people because I feel like the passion in young people it's just phenomenal. So I'm going to continue to work with young people. I'm going to continue to train them. And left with me alone, I will get the top students in the Gambia, train them and put them into different institutions in the Gambia before that culture of mediocrity seeps into them. So they go up there and they become the next leaders. It, it's sad, but that's the reality that we have to deal with. We are, we celebrate mediocrity. We celebrate, I mean, the, the bar is so low in this country. We set the bar so low that anyone can come and just walk over it, not even jump, we just walk over it. So we need to set our standards a little higher. We need to set the bar a little higher in every, every sector is lacking something. And as a leader, not even the president, but every sector that's, that's, you know, that has a leadership position, like the power status or whatever, you have to hire good people. You don't hire people and then you tell them what to do. You hire them and let them tell you what you need to do. Do I see a second coming? There will be a second coming. And this time, it's not going to be all like, I'm here. So if you notice, I've been coming for over the past few years. Come, go, come, go. So people see me and then they don't see me, they see me, they don't see me. But I'm slowly transitioning back. It will happen. So I'm setting things in place and then I'll come back. There's a second coming. Mentally you'll be ready this I'll time. I'll mentally be ready and I think I'll... And the whole system won't be frustrating exactly. as it was. Yes, hopefully. So I'm pushing. I'm in the background and I'm pushing. I'm pushing for change. I'm pushing and I'm, 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 I'm advocating for change. But it's, again, leadership. If you're not listening, I can push all I want, but if you're not listening, it's not going to happen. So I'm going to be persistent and continuing to push and see what happens. This is what we hear. Our young people are being trained. Our young people have a different mindset. They've now been influenced by social media, by their peers around the world. When we were going to school, we were not as connected as the youth now are. So that shift that this country will need in terms of leadership, in terms of expertise, in terms of professionalizing our civil service itself. A lot of people are being hopeful that is this generation of university students, particularly of the Gambia, who can make that change in the next couple of years, in the next decade or so. Do you I, believe that? I do believe that. I do believe that the young people are the ones that are going to make the change, and I do believe that. But um, they also have to have supporters. For me, I really, when I talk about training, my mode of training or the modality that I really use is that I put you in a position of the captain of the ship and I'm beside you. Get it? Failure is something I celebrate actually. You know, it's okay to fail and there's no shame in failing. What's, where the shame lies is when you don't know what to do when you fail. You just kind of give up. You can't pick yourself up. Yeah, you can't up pick yourself up. There's no, I say, you know, there, there's, you, you, I, I will stand right there with you and you steer me in the direction you want to go. At the end of the day, when we get where you want to go and it didn't work out, you can always turn back to me and say, Dr. Silva, it's not working out. I'm not there to kind of, oh, here's the training. Here's what we're going to do and then you're going to go implement. No, I want you to think. We, like you said, we've been talking about how innovative these young people are. Show me how innovative you are, and then I'll hold your hand together. We do things together. But I'm not going to be the one that's going to be thinking for you. You have to show me. You have to lead. You can't just say, you know, I hear a lot of the young people, some of the young people talk about, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that. Again, you can't keep waiting. You have to get into in the driver's seat. You have to take, there are a lot of things to do in this country. You've been doing a lot in this country. You came back. Some of us, you know, like, you know, uh, they, we ran. We'll now let you predict the future of the Gambia vis-a-vis -vis our young people, our politics, our government, and us as a country. Oh, that's a lot. So we start with what? The your politics? People? The people? Oh I'm, oh, I'm I'm so optimistic about this, the people of this country. I mean, I tell people um, we put bar on our box and brought him into the literally sat him down into the office all he had to do was deliver 
So the people of the Gambia, they are just, you know, we're just fantastic people and um, doing what we can do or need to do to survive. So I think the people will not, um, we have a problem in terms of our level of education. It's um, not as high as our well, not illiteracy rate. Illiterate yes, community. we have our yeah. So that illiteracy rate is a problem for me. But I think um, there's a lot of things going on. I think we will try to tackle some of that. And the issue with illiteracy is that you know some presidents or some governments around the world actually do want to repress people, don't educate you. Uneducated people, you just give them a little thing here and there, and you know it works. they they they're okay with it and they're happy. And not knowing that, if you can read and uh, and read and understand the basic, you know, you do know that. What the government is giving you, water, electricity, it's your basic human rights. They have to give it to you because it's your human rights. And of course, you have a social contract with them. They are your government. They're supposed to do that for you. But a, 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 a council person or a politician goes into one of these villages and bring in electricity or bring in water, everyone comes out clapping for you, happy for you. You've done this for us. No. Not, they have not done anything for you. It's their job to do it. You put them in there to do it for you. It's, it's your, your money. It's your money. It's your basic human right. It, you, it, it's for you. So people need to understand. We have to be educating our people about civic education. You need to understand your civic right and your civic duty. Your right and your duty. They have to go together. We have to be civically minded people. I think we will get there. We, we, we will get there. I'm optimistic about that. So um, I refuse to be watching from the sides now, and I want to come into the inside. And actually, you know, I've been on the sidelines for a while just watching. Thank you very much, Dr. Amir Tassila. It's been a pleasure having you on Harona. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Thank you.